G'day Internet, welcome back to another video. This here is my Macintosh Plus, circa 1986-ish. Now, the Mac Plus was the third in the Mac line after the 128 and the 512, um, and we'll go into the history of it in a minute. This one, however, isn't the happiest thing in the world, so let me show you. I'll turn it on. It goes beep, and we have nothing on the screen. But, if I do this, there's something there. I guarantee you this thing has bad solder joints on the analog board. So, the first thing we're going to do is crack this old girl open uh, and have a look uh, and basically go through and probably just reflow all the solder joints uh, on the power board. So, let's start with that. However, before we do, it's worthwhile taking a look at where the Macintosh Plus fits into the history of the Macintosh line and Apple in general. The Macintosh line was first introduced in 1984. Its launch is probably best remembered for Apple's fairly incredible ad that aired during the 1984 Super Bowl. Clearly trying to set themselves apart from IBM and the bland corporate machines that they were producing. However, the ad was probably a little too far away from reality. The first of the Mac line was an underpowered machine. Even with its 68,000 processor and custom video circuitry, its paltry 128K of RAM, which was shared with the video, was simply not enough to achieve what Apple set out to achieve. This original Mac was soon replaced with the Macintosh 512K, retrospectively calling the original model now the 128K. Although a step in the right direction, although being essentially a 128K with more RAM, the improvement just wasn't there. So even after two models, the Macintosh line was not a success and Apple still heavily relied on its Apple II line of machines to keep the business going. In 1986, however, Apple released the Plus, and it wasn't just the upgrade to 1 meg of RAM, expandable to 4 meg, but also the addition of the external SCSI interface. The Mac was finally able to connect to an external hard drive, as well as many other SCSI peripherals. Apple also extended the keyboard to include a numeric pad and arrow keys. Also bundled the Plus with both Mac Write and Mac Paint. For many, these were their very first introduction to what you see is what you get editing and set the standard for the Macintosh's foothold in the desktop publishing industry. The Mac Plus would run all the way through to 1990 as the base model of its range, even after machines like the SE and the Classic were released. Right, so we have our Mac Plus face down on a towel so we don't scratch the screen. Now to pull one of these apart is actually fairly straightforward but a pain in the ass at the same time, and that's primarily because of the two screws that are right down here inside the handle, and thus you need something long. But once you get it in there and feel around for it, they do come out. And the second one, can't get in there. I guess I could insert a that's what she said joke. That's not in. There it is. And the two that are just here. And in theory, right. Oh, because there's another one here. Right. Why isn't it coming apart? It should just come apart. Right, so it just needed a bit of a helping hand to break the seal, but all things being equal, voila, the inside, whoop, 
and I just lost two of the screws. The inside of a Mac Plus. There we go. There really isn't that much to it. We've got a CRT, a power board, a floppy drive, and the motherboard. That's kind of it. So whenever I'm working on anything with a CRT in it, the first thing I always do is discharge the CRT. So we will hook onto here and here and and we're good. Right. That means you can come off ish. <laughs> Feel my head getting in the way of the camera. All oh, right, okay. A pair of pliers would have made this a lot easier. All right. All right. So that's separated. Now, what is connecting? the analog board to everything else. We've got uh, here, this one. All right, I have to get a screwdriver in there. That's disconnected. Um, we've got this one here. And we've got an earth strap here this might be easier to undo from the motherboard I think uh, all right so we've got also got neck connection just a little awkward to get out All right so that's that disconnected that seems to be it right -oh. so if we now unscrew the board which seems to be here here And here, is there anything else to it? Um, no. That's it. Right, right, let's get the rest of the machine out of the way and look at the power board. Right, with the main power board out uh, and this plastic protector from the back removed from with all its little clips, we can actually get a look at the power board. And it's actually, I mean, it's not particularly dirty. I'm not really seeing anything, you know, black or that it's about to go put. If I have a look on the other side with my magnifying thing, I'm also not seeing anything that looks like you know a dry solder joint or a crack solder joint so what i think i'm going to do is go through and reflow oh, that looks a bit average all the big ones because what this tends to happen is that the, it's the heavy components on the board um, that eventually just through wear and movement and vibration uh, tend to wear out their solder joints. So prepare for a soldering montage as I go through and I do that.
so now that that's all done <coughs> I actually ended up going through and doing every joint on the board because honestly it was easier than constantly going do I need to do that one do I need to do that one it was just I just went through and did the whole lot so now that I've done that and I did actually spot a couple when you get really close up that were maybe a little dodgy so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stick it back in the chassis and plug in everything that needs to be plugged in um, not bother with the back cover just yet uh, and see if it works So I've got the whole thing back together as much as it needs to be. The back cover isn't on. I've got no keyboard, mouse or the external hard drive, but it's enough to see if it's actually going to work. So I guess it's a case of now or never. I really don't like switching these things on without any covers. We have beep. And we have screen. Awesome. We've got our flashy thing because I've got no boot disk in it, but the screen works. I am stoked with that. So with that power board now fixed, it works. It boots and I have a screen. Now, I know, already know that the rest of the machine runs because this thing used to be fine, um, but it's been transported a few times and I'm assuming that's what uh, did it to the power board. So the next thing is mainly um, cosmetics. Um, it's not like it's not too beat up or anything but there is if we have a look at the main case um, there's garbage on the top um, and this side is really really quite yellow if we have a look here it's really quite yellow compared to say the back of the other side so the next thing to do is well discharge the CRT again and this time really pull the thing apart and um, We'll get ready for some cleaning and some retro -briding. So one thing you may have noticed uh, during the disassembly process was some staining uh, as I pulled things like this RF shield out and you can see that moisture has obviously gotten into the base of this at some point so we're going to clean this up and then I also noticed on the bottom of the motherboard we've got some corrosion here um, I don't know if you can see that let me hold it up some corrosion around here now I'm hoping we can do this just simply with some alcohol and toothbrush right let's try this give that a second to soak and in theory there we go that looks better and I wonder if the same trick will work on the bottom of this. Mm, not, uh, 
not so much. But that's alright. The main bit is here. Let's give that a wipe out. Alright, well at least from the inside, which is the bit that counts, um, that's a lot better, so we're good with that. Um, both the underside of the keyboard, like the rest of the keyboard, the motherboard and the power board are all going to go for a trip out to the garage for a uh, hit with the air compressor. Uh, as you can see it's pretty grubby in here. So I'll hit them with the air compressor and this, and this will get cleaned up with some alcohol and probably um, the toothbrush as well. Um, but for now, the next thing I have to worry about is cleaning all the keys. Probably don't need to clean that. Cleaning all the keys, including the mouse button. Now, the upshot of these grey Apple keys is they don't yellow, which means I don't have to worry about retrobriting all these. And I like that. So, I'll grab a tub of hot soapy water and I'll probably use my scourer and let's get cleaning. Righto, with them all washed, these will now go to the sink and get all rinsed, so get all the soap off them. The other thing I then do is then I then actually take them all out to the garage and I spray out the bottom of every key while I hit it with the air compressor, basically to blow any moisture out of it. Um, for two reasons. One, it actually speeds up the drying process considerably because this is obviously the hardest part to dry because water pools in there. The other thing is, is I get really paranoid about moisture getting back into the actual keyboard mechanism. So, you know, it's, uh, that helps as well. So, these will get rinsed, blown out with the air compressor and then put out in the glorious Australian sun uh, where everything else is currently retro brighting um, and wait for them to dry. So there we go. Everything's now clean and uh, repaired and so forth. So I think the only thing left to do now to put it all back together.
With it all back together, I think it's actually looking pretty good. So there are a few reasons I actually wanted to restore this particular machine. The first thing is that it was actually given to me by a mate of mine, Jerry. So, g'day Jerry, um, thanks for the Mac Plus. The second one was that um, I actually think that Mac Plus, like I said before, has a fairly important part to play in the history of both the Macintosh line and uh, Apple in general. Like I said before, the first two models, the 128 and the 512, weren't really successes and it wasn't until the Plus came along that the Macintosh line started to kind of hit its stride. The third one is, is that when I started high school at Nara High School in 1990, these were the machines we had. You would go into the library in uh, at school um, and there were Mac Pluses. So there's a certain degree of nostalgia involved as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to power it on, start with the hard drive. These old hard drives really do make the best sounds. And now the Mac itself. And there we go. So thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and for now, I think I'm gonna play me some SimCity. possible.